Okay. I think we can start back. Okay, so we looked at thus far the central location measures, am I right? Which was your mean, medium, and mode. Oh, there's he here. Okay, so we said the central uh, location measures were mean, median, and mode. Now we're going to look at your non-central location measures, right? Because whichever position you want to look at, 80%, 60%, not centralized necessarily. So we're looking at quartiles. Quartiles divide an ordered set of data into quarters. Just by the name, it's easy to, to determine that, right? Quartiles, we're looking at quarters. And obviously, for quarters, there are four equal parts, right? So each part is referred to as 25%. So yeah, lower quartile, then you're going to say 25%, right? Um, the lower quartile is the data value that separates the 20, lower 25%. Of ordered values from the top 75%. Right? So let's look at, let's just take any ordered list of numbers 4, 6, 8, and 10. Right? So let's do 4, 6, 8, and 10. So the lower 25% is which part we are referring to? What? 4. Because Quarters, remember quartiles? It's four parts you're dividing into. So the number four will fall in the lower 25%. Okay. That is quartile one, right? Then you have, um, okay, your middle quartile. Don't worry too much about that. We don't normally ask you to calculate that. Um, or medium just divides the ordered set into two equal parts, right? So It'll be obviously in between uh, six and eight there. So it's two equal parts. It's four and six on this side, and there's eight and ten on the other side, right? Upper quartile, we also use this because remember, you are more interested in um, the data that falls on the lower end of the spectrum. Why is it there? Or data on the high end of the spectrum. Why is it there? What caused this high? So those uh, Q1 and Q3 are normally the most common uh, quartiles that we use, right? So upper quartile is that data value that separates the top or the upper 25% of ordered values from the bottom 75%. So if we look at our ordered list here, that will just be number 10 there. That will be in your upper quartile. Okay. Right. Um, let's do the next one. Still on this. It's showing you how to calculate it. So. Let's see, um, let's look back at our um, annual salaries, right? So see here, we have a table and we have your annual salaries here. So 250,000, 120,000, 300,000 and so forth. This is the list, the original data list that would have been given to you, data set. Then we ordered this. So can you see in the next column, we ordered it. So we started from the lowest to the highest. So let's go here. There's 110,000. We put it there. After 110,000, we see, oh, there's 120,000. We put it there. After that, 130,000, we put it there. Okay, so everyone happy how we got this ordered list. It's just your original data list. And you put it in the order from small to big, lowest to highest. Okay, happy. Now we want to determine the lower quartile value of salary. Now, why is this important? As an employee, I'd like to know if I'm sitting on the lower end of the spectrum or I'm sitting at the upper end of the spectrum, right? Not even for employees. I suppose just as an organization, you would want to know how many employees are being paid in, the, uh, in quartile one versus quartile three and so forth. Right, so the formula... To, uh, to determine quartile one. So you have to determine the position first, right? Because remember, N is always going to be different. Here we gave you N to be 10 because there's 10 salaries. But we could have given you 50 salaries, right? So if you give you 50 salaries, then obviously N becomes 50. Happy? Right, so here let's look at the formula. 
quarter one position is equal to n plus one because we gave you n being 10, 10 plus one is 11, right? 11 divided by four. What is 11 divided by four? You can read. <laughs> So 2.75, but that is giving you the position. Can you see here? Q1 position, not the value. It's not giving you the value. You're going to have to still work out the value. It's giving you the position. So in order to get quartile one of a data set of 10, you're going to have to look at position 2.75. Can you see this is not a whole number? To look at a value in position three is easy. Just go to count one, two, three. What is the number there? So now we just have to determine how you calculate the value that's in position 2.75. So how do we do this? Okay, let's see if we didn't miss out anything. Note that the salary corresponding to position 2.75 is between the second and third position. Self-explanatory. Self 2.75, more than 2, less than 3, right, in the ordered data set. Now, tell, if you don't order your data set in the exam, you are it's game over, right? It's game over for you. So um, I saw in one previous exam they put their hint, you must order your data. Set. I'm not sure I'm going to be so kind. No, I'm not going to be mean. I'm really, I'm not mean at all. You saw the assessments. And I'm not mean, but... You have to know something. I mean, and it's a key step. Ordering is a key step. It's, we've been saying it like 50 times now in this whole um, lecture, right? So you also have to take some responsibility for your learning, right? Right. The salary in the second position from the bottom. So let's go to our ordered list. Second position is 120,000, right? The salary in the third position is 130,000. So, quartile one is a value in between these two. Happy. Right? Yeah. So, therefore, quartile one is the 120,000 plus 0. 0.75. The 120,000 is in position two. So, that's why we got 120,000 there. So that takes care of the two there. Are, are we happy? See, 2.75, position 2.75. So we're putting the value that's in position two, which is 120,000. And then we want to determine the 0.75. Now, the 0.75 is in between 120 and 130,000. Agree? Right. So 130,000 minus 120,000 because it's in between there and we've already got the 120,000 there, right? So it's 0 0.75 multiplied by 130,000 minus 120,000, okay? So this part of the equation here, 0 0.75 times 10,000 essentially is 7,500. 7,500 plus the 120,000 is 127,500. Now, if you're doing your working out in the test or exam and if you get 145,000, you immediately know your answer is wrong because the answer has to be between what values in the second position and what values in the third position. Now, if you're good at maths or if you can just see things, you, you didn't have to work it out. 0.75 in between, <laughs> you know, it is one, two. It, oh, it's like I'm saying 0 0.5. 0 0.5 in between there, it is one, two, five thousand, right? But, but anyway, let's just do it systematically and put it in the formula. And even if you get your final answer wrong, but you have your formula there, you're going to get it right. Another thing about the exam, you will not be getting full marks if you just give me the final answer. No, even in your assignment, eh? We're going to look at the assignment just now. So if you give me the final answer, you don't get the full mark. I don't know how you got to the final answer. You need to demonstrate the steps to me. And all the steps all the way through, it's, it's simple, it's clear, right? There's the steps, okay? 
Right. Then we want to look at the upper quartile value of the uh, salary. And now we are looking at quartile three. Right. So when we look at quartile one, because one multiplied by any number is one. Am I right? I'm one multiplied by any number is the number itself. And you're saying yes when I said it's one. One multiplied by any number is that number. Right. So we didn't add the one there. See, we worked out Q1 position, but we didn't put the one there. Now we're working out Q3 position. So we have the three there, right? To work out the position, which is, and it's the same, it's the same formula. N plus one divided by four, but obviously three times N plus one divided by four. Now, what is N plus one? N plus one is 11, huh? 3 times 11 is 33. 33 divided by 4? 8.25. So, we want the upper quarter. So, the salary in position 8.25 is what we're looking for. Right? So, what is it going to be in between? Where? 8 and 9, right? Position 8 and 9. So if you count all the way there, this would be 8 and this would be 9 because that is 10, right? So your upper quartile is between 250,000 and 275,000. Happy? Because it is 8.25 between positions 8 and 9. So between the 8th and ninth position in the ordered data set. We note how we keep saying ordered data set. The salary in the 8th position. Salary there like we did up there. Salary in the 2nd position that was. This is salary in the 8th position. Is 250,000. So that plus 0.25. Because we want to determine the 0.25. Right? So 0.25 plus the 275 minus the 250. So the number in the ninth position minus the number in the eighth position. What do you get? So the obviously the whole sum you get 25. But then 0.25 of that's 75. So it's 25,000. So it's 0.25 of 25,000 is should be giving you 6,250. If the sum there is right. You can check it quickly. It's 0.25 times 25,000, we said. It's 6250. Does, does everybody get that? No? Yes? Okay, so this part of the equation is 6250 plus the 250,000, which is position 8. So 0 0.25 is essentially 6250. 250,000 plus the 0 0.25 is... 2,256,250. Right. Now, what does all of this mean? We have salaries being represented here. Right. I t you find out. No, not you find out. You obviously have to know your salary. Your salary is 120,000. What can you determine by that? You are in the lower quarter compared to your colleagues at work, you are earning in the lower quarter. If you say your, hus your husband, your salary is 260,000, what can we determine by that? Remember, we determine the upper quartile to be 256,250. So if I say you're earning 260,000 or 270,000, then your salary is in the upper quarter. Okay. Happy? Okay, so on to the next one. Right, similar to what we've just done. So we've done quartiles, but now we want to be specific and look at percentiles. So you can either work out the 60th percentile, the 80th percentile, the 70th percentile, because the formula is the same, right? So we already said percentiles are similar to quartiles. The lower quartile is the 25th percentile. So those equal. If the question asks you for the lower quartile, 
and the uh, questions asked you for the 25th percentile, we're asking you for the same thing, right? And the upper quartile is the 75th percentile, or we say upper quartile, it is, or quartile three, it is the same thing, right? Percentiles are calculated in the same way as quartiles. So this one is obviously simpler because we've already done quartiles. So we want to work out the 80th percentile value of the salaries. So 80th percentile, 80 divided by 100 is 0.8. So there we go here. The position, it is 0.8 multiplied by n plus 1. Whereas remember in the previous one, we just had the position multiplied by the, you know, but now we have the percentage, right? So 0.8 times n plus 1, so 0.8 times 11. Happy? You get 8.8. .8. So the 80th percentile is in position 8.8. .8. So let's go here. This is position 8. This is position 9. It's actually going to be closer to position 9 because it's 8.8. .8. See, if it was 8.25, it's closer to 8. It's closer to the value that's in 8. But now we're saying it's 8.8, .8, so it's actually closer to the value in, th that is 270,000. So let's work it out. The salary in the 8th position is 250,000. So there's your 250,000 there. Exactly the same formula like previously. The salary in the ninth position is 275. Thousand, so two hundred and seventy-five thousand minus the two hundred fifty thousand, which is the twenty-five thousand. There, don't forget we're getting the point eight from here and not from here. Hey, this could have been eight point seven. Okay, so the point eight for this is coming from this point eight there. So if this was eight point seven, then this would be point seven. Happy? It's not because it's eightieth percentile. I just think sometimes students would get confused. I just want to make that clear. So what it would be. So it's 0 0.8 times, is it 25,000, which is 20,000. So the 20,000 of this part of the equation plus the 250,000, we get 270,000. Can you see 270,000 is closer to 275? Because I said it's in position 8.8, .8, which is closer to position 9. Right, so it's so the eightieth percentile for the salaries it's two hundred and seventy thousand. Okay. Now this is the last part of the module, which is dispersion. It is the most difficult part of the all the calculations. I will not be asking you the extremely difficult calculations. I think it's just important that you understand it, right? So let's go through it now. Um, remember, we also have another class together on the 16th. It's not a class, but it's um like a revision session. So there I will give you a proper, like a breakdown sort of things, you know, for the exam, it's just that I haven't finalized the exam paper now, so I don't want to say, you know, don't focus on this, focus on that and so forth. We're not really, yeah, it's not like giving you the whole paper or something, but it's just a little help um, for the paper, right? So that will be, I think, on the 16th of October, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so dispersion. We already went through one um concept of dispersion, we did range. You remember we did range, we had the highest minus the lowest value. So it's the same here. It's the highest value, which is your maximum value, which is 300,000 minus your lowest value, which is 190,000. Easy. First dispersion is easy. And if you got your ordered list, you don't even have to look. You take the bottom number minus the top number. Right, so that is range. Then we have what we call variance. Now, what is variance? Variance is a measure of the average squared deviation from the central value. 
I don't think we should be doing this one. Oh, no, we can't do this one now because it's all on the slide. Yeah, yes. Okay. Before we move on, I don't think we calculated the mean for salaries. Calculate the mean for salaries for me. Let's go to the previous slide there. Calculate the mean for the salaries for me. What you got? Okay, so what you got for the mean? Okay, so let us see if you are right. Okay, so we there we go, 200500, right? So the mean, which you know how to calculate and you've calculated now, is 200,500, right? Now, what do we want to calculate? We know, this first two we know, right? This one was the given data set. This was the ordered data set. And the mean, you all know. Happy so far. Right. Now we want to see what is the deviation. We're looking at the deviation of this value from the mean. So you've just calculated the mean. So what is the deviation of 110,000? from 200 and, and 500. So the deviation is 200, 500 minus 110, 1, 2, 3. It's 90,500. But why do we have the brackets here? Okay. Yes. Because the 110,000 rand is 90,500 below the mean. So it's not above the mean. It's below the mean. So that is why we got 90,500 and it's negative. Right? So the brackets there represent it as negative. Now let's look at the next one. So you punch into your calculators, 200,500. Minus 120,000. Yes, but. Oh, how did we find? Oh, somebody's got a question at home. How did we find the deviation? Okay, so Joyce. The deviation is, so we're looking at the deviation from the mean, right? So we've just calculated the mean. So that's your 200, 500 down there, right? Now, we looked at this salary here. The first salary on the audit list was 110,000. What is the difference between this 110,000 and the mean? The difference is the, 90,500, but the 110,000 is below the mean. So therefore, it is negative. So therefore, we have it in brackets, right? So it's negative and the 110,000 is 90,500 below the mean. So that is the 
deviation. Do you understand that now, Joyce? Okay, cool. Okay, Joyce understands that. Now let's move on to, okay, perfect. Let me just close that. Oops. Oh, what happened there? Oh dear. Okay, right. So you will go down the line and calculate all in a similar manner. But can you see here, it reaches negative for the last time here because there's only a 500 difference between this salary and the mean, right? So this salary is 500 below the mean. So then it becomes positive thereafter because these values are above the mean. Can you see? 220,000 is above the mean, yes or no? It's above the mean by 19,500. So therefore, the 19,500 is not in brackets because it's positive. It is above the mean. So you're only going to have the brackets if it is below the mean, showing that it's negative. Okay. And likewise, if you go down here to 300,000, the, the deviation is the 99,500, but it's more, 99,500 more than the mean. So everyone happy how we got deviation, okay? Right. Then we have to square the deviation. What is squaring? What you do when you square something? Okay. No, not double. It's the number times itself. Right? So to square something, it is the number times itself. Now, if you have a number times itself, minus 1 times minus 1 is what? It's? No, negative 1. Okay, at home there we got someone saying 1. Yes, it's a positive 1. Because negative times a negative is a positive. Right? So why I'm making that point here? Can you see we have a negative deviation here? But negative 90,500 times negative 90,500 will give you a positive number. So therefore, we have all the squared deviations here being positive. Happy? All the squared deviations are positive because even if we had a negative number, it's that number times itself. Negative times a negative will give you a positive. So you can just do one or two to verify there. So let's go. Um, let's do the first one. 90,500 negative times 90,500 negative. It is 8190. Two five zero triple zero. Right, so I got the same thing here on my calculator. Okay, so that's how you get the squared deviation. Happy? Then what we're doing down here? We are summing all of these squared deviations. You're just adding it all up. That's all you're doing. Right. So can you see why I won't be asking you this specifically in the exam? The numbers are very long. For you to be punching it into the calculator. You, so I will ask you questions about standard deviation. See, like deviation is good to do up until a certain point. But when you go to square deviation, it becomes a little bit of a challenge for the students in the exam itself. So. But the sum here is simply adding up all of these squared deviations. So everyone happy so far? So we said variance, but we have a formula for variance. What is the formula? Squared standard deviations from the mean. Yes, it was the deviation from the mean, right? Squared standard deviation. The sum of it all. So it's this value down here. Happy? Because it's the sum. The sigma sign is sum. Sum 
squared deviations from mean. That's your value there. And it's sample size minus 1. So your sample size is 10 minus 1 is 9. So uh, you can punch it into your calculators. 42, 9, 2, 2, 500, 1, 2, 3. Mine doesn't even go there. My calculator don't even go to the last number there. Because you can see what challenges it can pose in the in the exam, right? But I would know to how to adjust that, so it's fine. Yes, and you get four seven six nine one double six double six. The reason why I didn't get the last six was because I, in my calculator I couldn't put the last zero. Can you see? I was short of one six ten. But the first part of the answer is exactly the same. Okay. So everyone comfortable. Formula for variance is the sum of the squared deviations from the mean divided by sample size minus one. In the exam, yes, you would need to know something like this, but I will see this final variance number. Your calculators will struggle even to get the sum part. So I can ask you deviation, squared deviation, right? But I can't, I, the, the sum and the variance, it's going to be a problem for some students' calculators, and then I'm going to have chaos in the venue itself, okay? So from that point of view. But so you still need to understand it and take it up to a certain point, but um, just not the final part in the exam. And you will do need to go buy now a special calculator just to calculate the one sum. You know, you would be able to show your understanding before that. Right. Now, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Now, we calculated <coughs> the variance on the slide already. Look here. We calculated the variance here. Right. So. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance, which we've just calculated. It measures how far each value is from the mean. Okay. The larger the standard deviation, the larger the variation in the data. So that's essentially what you take home from that. So salaries in the example below. So if there was a standard deviation of zero, it means that there is no variation. So the salaries are all the same. Okay. It is sensitive to outliers, just like how the mean is sensitive to outliers. It is often used in inferential statistics. Right. Remember yesterday we spoke about the different types of descriptive statistics and inferential statistics because most statistical theories are based on distributions described by their mean and standard deviation. Okay, so let's look at the formula for standard deviation. It is the square root of the sum of square deviations from the mean divided by the sample size minus one. Now, isn't this the variance? Let's go back to the previous slide. What was variance? Sum of squared deviations from the mean divided by sample size minus one. Can we see that? So if we come to this slide, it will be square root of the variance. Happy? Because see inside here. Can you see inside here? Sum of squared deviations from mean divided by sample size minus one. It's, it is the variance. Can you see the variance formula? It is that. So to calculate the standard deviation, in essence, what we are saying, the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the variance. Happy? Okay, and the variance we calculated on your previous slide. So let's go to the previous slide. If you do the square root of the variance, okay, so we've got this variance actually listed here for you on the slide and the previous slide. 
So let's do square root of that variance value. Square root of 4, 7, 6, 9, 1, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6. Don't do the point. Just stop before the point 6, 7. Your calculators are going to go crazy. I get 69,059. I get this here. I get that value 0. 0.153, but we're going to leave out the 0. 0.153. So can you, did you all do that on your calculator? Mm -hmm. And did you get 69,059? Yes. So in the exam, I can ask you to calculate standard deviation, but I will give you the variance. And then you would need to know that this part is equal to the variance. So I will give you the value for variance. And then you would need to know that the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. And this part of this formula is equal to the variance. Happy? Okay. So the standard deviation for the salaries, like we've just calculated now, it is 69,059. The mean salary, which we've calculated, you've calculated that for me, we had the value down there. That's the 200, 500 there. We can see that the lowest salary, which is your 110,000 here, right? And the highest salary, which is 300,000 there, is over one standard deviation from the mean salary, right? So that will help us to determine or make decisions about the dispersion of the salaries in the organization. That is essentially why we do this. So generally, for a symmetrical distribution, 95.5% of all salaries will lie within two standard deviations from the mean, right? So what do you think? The salary distribution data is symmetrical. It's not symmetrical, right? Because the, um, it is more than one uh, standard deviation away from the mean, okay? So it's not uh, like an equitable spread, if that's what you want to call um, the salaries. So that's your standard deviation. But if I ask you to calculate standard deviation, I will give you the variance. Okay. And the previous exams that I've seen, they do not um, give the formulas. So you're going to have to know the formulas, right? Um, but again, I will give you more. Oh, what's going on? I will give you more, a, a more of a clear idea of the exam when we have that discussion, right, on the 16th. Okay, then we have the coefficient of variation. This is a measure of relative variability. It is expressed as a percentage. Um, what is this useful for? So it's useful to measure or to compare one sample to another. So remember, we have different data sets that we can work with. So we can work with the data set from 2024. We can work with the data set from 2023, right? So this um, coefficient of variation helps you to compare two different data sets, essentially. So when comparing one data set to another, a data set with a smaller coefficient of variation indicates that many data values are close to the mean. So if the CV value is lower of one data set than the other, that means the values are more concentrated to the mean of this data set versus the other data set. Okay, so we're looking at a CV, a lower CV value between the two data sets will be considered to be better. OK, because the values are more closer to the mean than the other data set. OK. Sometimes you just got to read it a little bit more like on your own to process, but also you must ask questions, whether it's sending emails or in the next session. OK, right. So let's look at this. The coefficient of variation 
is your standard deviation divided by the mean multiplied by 100. We have all of these values already. Standard deviation was 69059, remember, on the previous slide. That divided by your mean, 200, 500, multiplied by 100 is 34%. You can try the calculation. Now, if you had 34%, now we calculated the CV for another data set and we got 48%. So which one is better? The lower one, this one. Why? Because it means the smallest CV means that the data values are closer to the mean of this data set versus the other data set. Happy? Yes? No? Move on? Not? I can explain again if you need. You're fine. Okay. Mm, and back at home there? Everyone's well? Okay. So now we want to look at the skewness of your graph, essentially. Right? So we plot our data on a graph. So we want to see how skew it is. This means certain things, right? So if you have what we sometimes refer to as a normal shape or a symmetrical shape, that means your mean, median, and mode are close in value. Okay? If you have, for example, um, the, the skewness is positive or it's to the left, we say, no, positive is skewed to the right. What is that? Not according to me, though. Okay, the negative, let's look at it, right? So the negative skew is here. There will be few extremely large values. Okay, so, so symmetrical is perfect for everyone to understand, right? Your mean, medium, and mode is uh, in line with each other. So with positive skewness, so you have your median, which is lower. Can you see your median is lower than your mean? And the mode is lower than the mean. So it's skewing to the one side. To me, it's skewing to the left. Yeah. Isn't it? Oh, I'm looking at it. Oh, sorry, sorry, my direction. Yeah, okay, so I'm looking at it differently. So it's skewed to the right, right? Okay. So can you see the mean, median and the mode is lower than your mean? That's essentially what we want to see here. We want to be able to classify your data, right? So if we say symmetrical, what is your understanding? Mean, medium, mode are similar or close in value, right? If I say positively skewed, you're going to say your medium and mode are lower than your mean. Then if I say negatively skewed, what is it? Your mean, mean and no, your median and mode is higher than your mean. Okay, so that is negatively skewed. So can you see here, with a positively skewed shape, there will be few extremely large values. Because can you see which side of the um, chart it's falling on, right? It's falling on this side of the chart where the values are lower. Negatively skewed shapes, there will be few extremely small values. So, because if your median and mode is higher than your mean, so there are fewer small values. That's how come it's higher, right? Because remember, what is your mode? Okay, now let's go. What is your median? It's the number that's in the middle. It's easier to actually use the median than the mode. The mode is simply the most frequently occurring uh, number. So 
for a measure of this kind, it's actually better to use the medium and the mean to try and understand the charts because mode, it is the number that occurs most frequently, right? It can be any number really. The median, remember, is your midpoint. You arranged um, the list, your values from smaller to large and you found the midpoint of that. Am I right? So you found the midpoint there, which was your median. So here we're saying the median is higher than the mean. So we are saying that there are not many small values because the median is more to the right. Can you see? It is greater than the mean. So if I was you, I won't use mode so much here to try and determine because mode is difficult to use because it's the number of times that the number appears. Whereas the median is it's technically in the middle. It's telling you the midpoint. And here it's telling you that your mean is lower than your midpoint essentially. So which is telling you if the mean is lower than your median, then there are fewer uh, small values. Right? And then this opposite obviously is for the positive skew. Right. But this one, you will not be drawing this at all. Hey, you will not be drawing this. It's just to determine how the data is spread. If it's spread positively, negatively, if it's symmetrical, that's, that's all you need to know with that. OK, then another way to, to calculate um, the skewness. Um, we did histogram previously, but we did histograms, I think, that have one peak. We're going to look just now at our histogram looks like to have two peaks and what it means, what we need to do. Right. So to calculate this, so if your skewness is zero, the histogram is symmetrical. Right. So that means your medium and your mean are the same. Can you see here they took out the mode? Because the mode is just making it, yeah, yeah, it's it's making it too confusing because mode is the number of times a number is appearing. It does not um, have meaning for the symmetry of the data, right? So if your coefficient is greater than zero, the histogram is positively skewed, right? So that means the mean is greater than the median, okay? And if your Pearson's coefficient is equal to 0 0.3, it is moderately skewed. I will not be asking you this. Because also to calculate it, I'm thinking, you're going to have to go through the whole series of, unless I give you the values to plug in. Yeah, the only way is if I give you the values. Else you're going to have to do all the calculations to get to this point. Right. And then it would be the errors like carried down. Yeah. And it makes marking too difficult. So you won't get one way. You have to calculate everything from scratch here. Right. You'll be given the values that you would have to plug into the formula then. OK. So if your Pearson's coefficient is less than zero, then the um, histogram is negatively skewed. OK, and that's simply plugging in the values here. We calculated mean, we calculated median. Happy? And did we calculate standard deviation? Yes. So you just plug in those values into this formula. But obviously, then it's three multiplied by your mean minus your median divided by the standard deviation. OK. Um, I'm not sure if we have um, an example for this. I don't think so. Because we didn't do... Um, see, the uh, examples we did for standard deviation, we didn't calculate the median and stuff for that one. Am I right? We calculated the mean, but we didn't do the median. So that would be the only one that we then would need to calculate. The mean, which was 200, 500, minus a median that we need to calculate 
divided by the standard deviation, which was 69059 or something like that. Okay, so you plug that into this equation. Okay, so we say, oh, there we go. <coughs> it's calculated on the slide. <coughs> Given a mean salary of 200, 500, we had calculated this. The median is given to us here, 210,000. And the standard deviation, which we calculated, was 69,059. Calculate the approximate skewness. So calculate the approximate skewness. Don't look there. So what was the formula? Let's go there. Let's write the formula down. Three times. Um, mean minus median divided by standard deviation. Now plug in the values here. And see if you get that. Three times. Don't forget the three times, right? Yeah, so you get negative 0, uh, 0,41, right? So which we've calculated now. What does this tell you about the salary in the department? Okay, yes, um, there's a precise answer on the group there. Right, so what does this tell you about the salaries in the department? The lower salaries are the source of the skewness here because you have a negative 0.41, right? See, the mean is less than the median. Is that the truth? No, I'm going to go back now. See, the mean is less than the median. Can you see that? Mean is less than the median. If you go back here, the mean is less than the median. It's negatively skewed. But you got that already because you got a negative 0.41. Right? So you got that already, negative 0.41. And you also can see that the mean is less than the median because you needed those values to plug in. So you could already tell. Even if you didn't put it into the formula, the fact that the mean was less than the median, you'd be able to say that it's most likely um, less than zero. Oh, why am I going back instead of front? Okay, so that's the calculation there. Okay, this one, you do not have to know leptocurtic, mesocurtic, platycurtic and so forth, right? We're just showing you what is the normal distribution, what peak looks like, flatter versus more peak, right? But you do not have to know the different forms of ketosis, right, for this module. This is only year one. Ketosis describes the amount of peakness in your distribution. Remember, we're looking at the dispersion. So the flatter the curve, so this is flatter. Can you see it's flatter at the top there? So the flatter the curve, the greater the spread of data. Remember, we're looking at dispersion. So the data is spread over a greater amount. This means that the standard deviation is larger relative to the mean. Okay, but again, you are not going to be tested. We didn't even include in the notes leptocurtic and so forth. We just wanted to show you that there are other means of determining the dispersion of data. Okay, but the dispersion that we are familiar with or, or comfortable with, it is the range, which is the first one that we did. And we did the CV was the second one. I think that is with regards to dispersion as much as you, we would go for you. Okay, then we have bimodal distribution. Now, a histogram. We know what is a histogram, right? We saw that earlier on in the lecture, okay? 
there's your frequency. What is this representing? Frequency is your count. And it's a count of something, some occurrence, right? So that is what this histogram is representing. Now, this is a good exam question, I think, right? This is what we call a bimodal histogram. It's a histogram. Bimodal, why? Because it has two peaks. Can you see there? That's not difficult to see, right? So it has two peaks. So when a bimodal distribution exists, that means when there's two peaks on your histogram, it is necessary to segment the total sample into two subsamples. So you're going to separate this somewhere here and you're going to have two samples, okay? Based on an identified external influencing factor, be it gender, brand, supplier, whatever it may be, right? Before proceeding with further descriptive or inferential statistics, because you're not going to be able to adequately describe it if it has two peaks. Because something is causing it to peak here versus something else may be causing it to peak here. So you would need to describe it in terms of what is causing the peak. Okay. Then identical but separate statistical analysis can be performed on each subsample. So when you break this up into the two parts, it will be called a subsample. Okay, so that's not essentially what we'll ask you in the exam. So what we we can ask you is, um, what does it mean um, if a histogram is bimodal? Right. So you would need to know what that means, and maybe one other thing. Um, let's see. I'm already thinking of an exam question. When a bimodal distribution exists, it is necessary. Yes. So you need to tell me what you would do if you encounter a bimodal distribution. So the question can be: What does it mean if you encounter if there is a bimodal distribution? And then the next part of the question is: What would you need to do? Um, if there is a bimodal distribution. Obviously, in nicer words. Yeah, not in such silly English, but yeah, in nicer words. Yeah, that would be a nice exam question. for. Remember, I'm setting three exam papers because it's the main exam, it's the sub-exam, and it's the special exam. And I don't know which one you're going to get. But for this kind of a module, you are luckier. And the nature of the questions calculation-wise will be the same across all only thing that will differ is some of the theory questions yeah but the calculation ones will be the same with different values obviously so that is no let's see i don't know oh no don't worry this is just software that you can make use of um to, but you're not going to really need it to for the exam you can use the software for the assignment, you can, but I want to see the working. I don't want just the final answer. You will only get part of the marks if the final answer is right. And because that's the whole point is to show me um, how you got there. So now what I want to do is I want to, oh, no, I need to open up assessment three. Let me go to um, where my analytical techniques. Let's do assessment three there. Okay. <laughs> assessment three. Let me go back there. And I want to share a window. No, I don't. No, what do I want to share? Share. Oh, there we go. Um, but there was a question also on the chat. Let me just try and pick up that question again. Sorry, I didn't. It uh, moved away from my screen. How do I get back there? Let's oh, let's stop sharing for a moment, and let me go to the chat. There was a chat. 
Um, doctor, would you be uploading the class recordings on Moodle? Yes, I will be uploading the recordings. Um, yeah, I will do that. It'll this one will finalize on even tomorrow morning, and then I'll upload both for you. Um, window assessment three somewhere. There we go. Okay, so as promised, yesterday we went through assessment one and two just to see if you understood the questions. So today, and you would see that assessment one and two is open. Yeah, and uh, today assessment three then would open, right? Um, don't forget about the deadlines and all of that. I do know I will be changing a few things. Only the waiting is going to change, nothing else, right? Everything else stays the same. Okay, so let's see here. Very easy. The numbers only have changed. Because we want to see the practice, right? So the table below represents total frequency. Y'all know, right? It's about showing now your understanding. Relative frequency, you know, okay? Frequency table, okay, this is a little bit of a theory question. How can a frequency table be displayed graphically? You're going to read your notes and see that one, right? Uh, then we have another table here. This is your two frequency table. Can we see? Bag, clothing brand and gender, right? Then we have here, ah, we have the range. Remember, we worked with the range. Um, Okay, so it's all very straightforward. It's really practicing what we've done today. The table below shows the car sold each month. Okay, obviously the values are not, not the same, right? But um, conceptually, uh, the questions are the same. Again, I kept this also the same for you. I'm just testing if you understood what happened today. That's essentially what. This is nothing new, lower quartile. And then I'm asking a question, if a person is earning 280,000 rands, which um, would be earning above or below, yeah, right? So you just have to read and understand. And then there's two or three um, theory questions. What is data collection, variables, measurement and so forth. Anything here that you think you will not be able to do. See, we got standard deviation, but we didn't do dispersion. Can you see I didn't test you on dispersion? Yeah. In the exam, there will probably be one in each paper, one question regarding dispersion. It is a difficult concept. The first two are pretty, pretty easy, but the others are a bit difficult to explain. Any questions about the assignment? It looks very familiar to you. Okay. Yeah, so good luck. Please take note of all your due dates. I will be sending reminders um, as announcements also. You're welcome to contact me at any time. Should you not understand anything and need clarification or need something retort, I will be posting this tomorrow. Um, the recording, right? So I'm actually going to stop the recording now. But you're welcome to ask me questions. I'm still here. We've covered all the content we need to cover. Yes, we didn't need two full days, but it's also 